Good evening. I want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. We're going to be looking at John chapter 15, verse from verse starting at verse 18, and we're going to continue through the 16th chapter of verse 14. And we're going to look at if the world hates you. And we know what that means from the standpoint as a Christian, what Christ has taught us that uh, the world will hate us because it, the world hates him. But before we go into the word, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. As we come to study about you, to unpack some of the richness of who you are. Father, first of all, I just want to say thank you for bringing Sister Trudy through surgery. Uh, you just so wonderfully bless each and every day of our lives. Thank you for being mindful of the things that we go through, for your grace, for the strength that you grant us day by day. Father, continue to bless our church. May we grow and prosper in you. And Lord, I pray that may you be at the helm of this ship. And we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Back in, I think it was 1926, so almost 100 years ago, there was this uh, young reporter, and he hadn't, it hadn't been long since he had graduated from Harvard, and he was working in China. And in the course of doing his job, he was seeking out this uh, interview with this Bolshevik by the name of Michael Borden. Now, Borden was at the time uh, the cause of considerable chaos in Western trade. And this young reporter uh, located Borden in Canton. Uh, and he presented his introduction to the Russian's Vietnamese secretary and was ushered into the Russian's presence. Now, the American here was surprised by Borden's reception. Uh, seated with Borden, the reporter's mind began to speed through the scant information that was available about Borden. Borden had served time in a Glasgow jail. Earlier, he had taught school in Indiana and Chicago, and he had been handicapped, or handicapped, excuse he'd been picked directly by Lennon for the job that he would have. Now, eagerly, the, this reporter began the interview asking questions about the realism of Borden's goals. But in a short time, the tables began to be turned, and Borden began to press the, the attack. He said, now, you forget, young man, I'm not here for my help, or I would not be working in this barbarous heat. I don't spend my time at bars and races like the English and the French. I'm not interested in a career or a fortune like the Americans. I serve an ideology. And with an ideology, it is not numbers that count. It is dedication. He said, you Americans would not understand it. I've lived many years in your country and I know what goes on. You concentrate on comfort and personal success. Now, this young reporter, he got uncomfortable with this. And so he tried to divert the conversation back on Borden. And he said, he asked him, he said, enjoy? Do you enjoy your work in China? And Borden looked at him, enjoy? But what are you talking about, man? He said, that's a burger just... Uh, question. It is not a matter of whether we enjoy our work here. The work is necessary, and that's all that counts. Far from friends, concerts, and the theater that would mean so much to me in Moscow. But long ago, he said, I made up my mind that communism alone held an answer for the world, and nothing else matters. Does that answer your question? Now, for the first time, when I looked over this article that I was reading, uh, I began to look at what we look at in our society today and the pursuits that are largely determined by the question, personal enjoyment. Now, it's not wrong in itself, 
But let's look at some things. Uh, one writer, probably 50 years ago might be, but now, uh, said it's no accident that at the present time the dominant trends in psychoanalysis include the rediscovery of narcissism. The society is marked by self-interest, egotism, that increasingly reduces all relations to the question, what am I getting out of it? Now, I want to tell you something today. That attitude has penetrated the church and has for three or four generations. Many think Christianity exists only to make us healthy and wealthy, to bring smooth sailing to our lives. After the dedication of the Graham Center in Wheaton, uh, there was this woman who uh, was so critical of this blind musician being included in a performance. She said his presence was a slam on the goodness and the grace of God and on the faith of the participants. If he just had enough faith or if the others on the program had enough faith, he would be healed. Yes, a healthy spiritual life does contribute to physical health. And God still heals miraculously, and I believe this with all my heart. And attention to scriptural principles often aids one's prosperity. A righteous life does indeed avoid many difficult obstacles, but that is not always the lot of godly believers, is it? Godly believers are not always wealthy. They sometimes have physical difficulties. Sometimes they suffer and are persecuted. The danger of the health, wealth, smooth selling, prosperity, gospel people is obvious. But when life does not fit our theological box, some toss faith out and deny reality. Now, People react like that every day. We see this here in our passage today in John chapter 15, verse 18 through chapter 16, verse 14. What are proper expectations and duties as we follow Christ in a fallen world? What are they? Jesus' words must have jolted the disciples, for they came in the midst of positive reinforcement that began back in chapter 14. And Christ had been speaking about not letting our hearts be troubled, about the benefits of abiding in him, about the love that is to exist between believers. And when all of a sudden he turned to matters of trials and the world's hatred. So uh, when we look at this, the scripture said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. You know what Jesus said? If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Now remember the words that I spoke to you. Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. If, the, if they obey my teaching, they will obey yours. Now, this is a joke, didn't it? A Christian who follows Christ must expect to be hated. Jesus gave several reasons for this. The world hated me. If the world hates you, keep in mind they hated me first. He goes on to say, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. Now, when we speak the truth, we see this in church. People get mad at the preacher. Oh, that preacher, he's a meddling. Oh, he wouldn't ask, he, he wouldn't salt information about this or that or the other. I want to tell you something. 
when a man stands under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and shares with you the truth of the gospel as God gives it, some folks is going to get upset. Some folks who claim to be Christian are going to show their sin because they don't like it when the truth slaps them square in the face. Now, Jesus' life specifically through his word and his works demonstrated by contrast how sinful the Jews were. They hated him for that. His inner righteousness drew their abiding hostility because it revealed the shabbiness of their external goodness. Once this African chief, in this case a woman, happened to visit a mission station. Now hanging outside the missionary's cabin on a tree was this little mirror. Now the chief happened to look into the mirror and saw her reflection. With its hideous pain and evil features, she gazed at her own terrifying countenance and jumped back in horror. She said, who is that horrible looking person inside that tree? The missionary said, it is not in the tree. The glass is reflecting your own face. Now the African would not believe it, until she held the mirror in her hand. And she said, I must have the glass. How much will you sell it for? The missionary said, I don't want to sell it. And she begged until finally he gave up. She took the mirror, exclaiming, I will never have it making faces at me again. She threw it down and broke it into pieces. Now that is precisely now listen to me, that is precisely what the Jews did with Jesus, and tragically, it goes on today. We hate to see what we really are. You know, it's, it's very difficult to get folks to, to ask God to do one simple thing in their life. Now, and I won't say I do this every day, but I've done it a couple times over the last week. God this day, Reveal to me what you see when you look at my heart. May I look in the mirror and see clearly what you see when you look at me. Now, sometimes that can be frightening. And this woman, she, man, she, she, looked, she had never seen her face in a mirror before. And it just frightened her. And I... I want to tell you, there's a whole lot of folks who claim to be Christians. If they saw what God sees, they'd be frightened. A good look at Jesus, and when we look at Jesus, we can get a better idea about ourselves. It's going to result in either abiding hatred or love. And people have the same reaction toward Christ's followers. Now, the second reason for the world's hatred is found in Verse number 19, he said, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Now, that is why the world hates you. Now, the world used here, I think the Greek word was cosmos, is used several times in this one verse, and it refers to the sinful world system. The world hates believers because they are not part of the system. We're not part of the clique. It always opposes those who do not conform. But of course, persecution is not always violent. Not every godly Christian is constantly persecuted and not all unbelievers hate Christians. But the system always does but not every individual. Persecution wears many faces. Most often it is reflected in the attitude and not necessarily in action. Sometimes it takes the form of indifference and we are treated as non-entities. Other times it is avoidance. Uh, people just, you know, 
They'll take, take a wide loop, loop around us. Sometimes it reaches repulsion uh, or a growing aminosity. Now, we need to be mindful of these things. Uh, A.T. Robertson one time said, persecute as it's written in verse number 20, has this sense to chase like a wild beast. They were martyrs for Christ in the twin. There's more martyr, martyrs today than there's ever been. The misery of the early church is being reenacted every day. And it could even happen in the United States even more than it's been. We could be, become a whole lot more like it is overseas. And, and I think we're seeing that writing on the wall, aren't we? Can we face the reality? If we're going to serve God, if we're going to be Christians, it's not going to be about our, what can I get out of it, but it'll be about our commitment, our dedication to who Christ is. Much like Borden, the communist out of the Bolshevik, that it wasn't about what he could get out of it, but it was about letting the world know that, in his opinion, communism was... The answer. Well, I want to tell you something. There's only one answer for the world today. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified, resurrected on the third day, living at the right hand of the Father. And it cannot be based on what you and I get out of it. Because if we base our relationship with God on just on nothing else but what we get out of it, we're going to end up the loser. The third reason for persecution is what he says here in verse 20. Remember the words that I've spoken to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will also obey yours. Now, if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. In 1937, Bonhoeffer was executed at the end of the war uh, in a German consecration camp. And he wrote this in his book called The Cost of Discipleship. Suffering is the badge of the true Christian. The disciple is not above his master. Luther reckoned suffering among the marks of the true church. Discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ, and it is therefore not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer. Now, such persecutions would be proportionate to the extent of what your identification with Christ is. Jesus' teachings demands that we draw some conclusions. One primary deduction is that smooth sailing is not necessarily a sign that God is pleased with our lives. The absence of persecution may actually indicate something is wrong. Think about that. If nothing is, if everything is great in the church, is the church where it should be? Such was the case with Lot. He tried he tried of uh, the separate life in the hills of Palestine, pitched his tents near Sodom until finally he was firmly entrenched in the life of the city. And when the day of judgment came, the angels commanded him to go to his relatives in the city and with this message that judgment was coming. The scripture says his sons-in-law thought he was joking. He had lost his credibility along the way. Now, most people are not so crass, but they tried to find a comfortable spot between the extremes of godly life and the sinful one. And they achieved this at the cost of their own life. Because why? They prefer a smooth sea to, be, to being possessed by God. Because when we are 100% possessed by God, there's going to be a lot of rough seas that we're going to walk across. They go through life with little difficulty because they have accommodated themselves to the world. 
At the same time, persecution is not necessarily a sign of God's blessing. The godly are not under a sword at all times. What do the Proverbs say? When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. Now, that is true. Though we never completely escape the enmity of the world system. Now, we must also remember that some of the persecution that Christians endure is because of their own sin. An employee of the secular college uh, that I'm familiar with claimed that he was being persecuted with for his Christianity, and he felt ostracized and as he tried to deal with the problem. But when he had asked what he'd done, he said, well, I grabbed a guy by the coat and told him if he bugged me anymore, I'd, leave, I'd just let him have it. Now, after this, he reported his persecutors were becoming more uncivilized. Sometimes we are persecuted because of our own stupidity, maybe our own rudeness. But persecution is not necessarily a sign that we're following Christ. Now, a lie pleasing to God is a life that by example, by word, by deed, demonstrates the righteousness of Christ. It thereby condemns the world. And as a result, the believer is in some way persecuted. Consider Daniel, the only person in Scripture of whom much is written, who has no recorded sin. We don't read many, about many folks in the Bible that doesn't have a recorded sin, do we? He was an exemplary man, so much so that the world system tried to kill him. But God stopped the lion's mouth. One guy wrote, the world would not hate angels for being angelic, but it does hate men for being Christians. It grudges them their new character. It is tormented by their peace. It is infuriated by their joy. Now, for whatever reason, the follower of Christ should expect times of persecution. Paul wrote in Timothy, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul also wrote in Philippians, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we're going to be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. Peter wrote, dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the suffering of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Now, what do? What, what does God expect us to do? To retire? To draw back? Absolutely not. We are forbidden to return evil for evil. So then what is to be our response? The Bible says, When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Now, persecution is not an excuse for silence, but it does challenge us to witness to share Christ lovingly to a hostile world in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there was this little boy named Stevie. He was quiet, he was shy, he moved to this new neighborhood. One day he came home from school and he said, you know, Mom, Val <clears throat> excuse me, Valentine's Day is coming up. I want to make a valentine for every 
one in my class. I want them to know that I love them. Now his mother's heart began to sink at the prospect of her son's rejection. Every afternoon she watched the, the children go home from school laughing and hanging out with one another, all except for her little boy who always walked behind them. But at the same time, she did not want to discourage uh, her well-intentioned son. So she purchased glue, paper, crayons, and for three weeks, her little boy made 35 valentines. He took a lot of pain in doing this. But when the big day came, he stacked the valentines under his arm. He ran out the door, and then his mother thought, man, you know what? This is going to be a tough day for my little feller. So she decided to bake him some cookies and have some milk ready when he comes home from school in order to maybe ease the pain of him not getting many valentines. Well, that afternoon, she had the warm cookies and milk out on the table. She went over to the window, scratched a little frost off the glass, and she looked out, and sure enough, here come all the children laughing, Valentine's tucked under the arms, and there was her little boy walking behind the other children. He's walking maybe a little faster than usual, and she thought, bless his heart. He's ready to break into tears. His arms were empty. He wasn't carrying any Valentine's. Now, her little boy came to the house, and his mother said, honey, mom's got some warm cookies and milk for you. Just sit down. Now her boy's face was all aglow, and as he marched right by her, all he could say was, not a one, not a single one. I didn't forget one. They all know I love them. Now, figuratively speaking, Christ did not get a valentine, did he? but he did not forget a single person. And we are to be like him. Lovingly, we are to go get them for Jesus. Openly, lovingly, joyously. The scripture says, all, I, all this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who th kills you will think he is offering a service to God. We got them in our churches today. They'll go out and they'll say all kinds of nasty stuff about people thinking they do God a favor. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. Now this is Jesus speaking. Now, it's not Richard. This is what Jesus said. He said, I have told you this. So that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I've told you these things. So that if you have supposed that in following me, you're going to have some smooth sailing, don't be disillusioned. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. What Jesus prophesied came true. The disciples did not stumble. All except John, it appears, died martyrs' deaths. They understood Jesus was hated, and so were they. They were not part of the world order. They were obedient as they lovingly shared Christ. As this reporter saw Borden later in life, and the bullshit here was a little more, more contemplative moving as they began to talk. The communist was gazing out the window and he began murmuring partly to himself and partly to the reporter. And he said, you know, he mused, I used to read the New Testament again and again and again. And, again. and he said, you know what? It was one of the most wonderful story that's ever been told. You know, that man, Paul, he was a revolutionary. I take my hat off to him. He made a symbolic gesture. His long black hair would get falling over his face and then a long silence. And he began to shake his fist. And he said, but where do you find Paul today? Where do you find him today? 
Answer me that. Where do you find him? Where? You can't answer me, can you? We can. Followers of Christ, like Paul, have been in China. Hudson Taylor. Others like John and Betty Stam, who had their face sealed in blood at the hands of Borden's followers. Men and women whose lives were like Jesus. Today they're on every continent. Some suffering persecution, others are not. But their lives all speak one thing, Jesus. And we're called to follow their example of following the Savior no matter what the cost. We don't have to go to China. We don't have to go to South America. We don't have to go to Russia. We can go in our own backyard and we will find the same persecution if we are a follower of Christ. I want to tell you today, Do not follow Christ for what you may be able to get out of it, but follow Christ for what you may give to him and others. Lord, we thank you for this day. What a great day it is as we close out this Wednesday evening, as sharing of some of the richness of who you are. Father, I pray that may we just be able to be rooted deeper and deeper May our relationship gain strength, gain vigor for the cause of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.